Ladies and gentlemen, you can grab a seat if you can find one. Just have a few parish notices before we start this evening's talk. On the 10th and 11th of February, Candlelight Club Valentine's Ball, tickets still available. On the 25th of February, Sunday, there's a Tweed Ramble organised by Pre Cali. Uh, it'll be a Tweed filled jaunt across Hampstead Heath. Details on our interweb page. Uh, Honest John, there's a selection of gents haberdashery on the bar. If anybody wants to look at that. And the next monthly meeting will be 6th of March, where Luca will give part two of his talk on newness in form and spirit. Uh, now for tonight's talk, delighted to welcome Aidy, who will talk on Luisa Marchesa or Marchesa Casati. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> welcome everyone. Lovely to see so many faces, some new and some old. It was fantastic. Thanks for really from bottom of my heart. I hope I'm not to be so long and too boring. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tonight we're going to talk about this lady that, uh, as uh, you can see here, was born uh, towards the end of the 19th century, on Je 23rd of January 1881, and uh, in Milan, and uh, she died the 1st of June in uh, 1957 in London. But this, I think, is going to be the only few dates I will mention, because I would like to talk about her as a woman, as a character, a personage, you know, not uh, through the uh, steps in life and uh, various events and so on, but for what uh, she done and what she still does in a sort of way beyond the grave. Uh, Marchesa Casati was born you know, actually, sorry, I already started. I started from the, actually the bottom. This is her grave. <laughs> I've forgotten about this. Sorry, because I do this extempore. I don't have any, nothing written, just a memory and so on. This is, uh, I would like to start with the end of the Marchesa. She died, as I said, in London, uh, in, um, in her little flat just behind the, the Royal Opera House. No, sorry, the um, Royal Albert uh, yeah, Royal Albert House, that she, where she lived the last few years in, uh, of her life in total poverty, in total misery. She was the shadow of what she used to be, the, the incredible rich woman. The, she was one of the, the biggest heiress uh, of, uh, of her time. And uh, this is her grave uh, that it was paid by um, a couple of gentlemen friends. They support her with her niece, uh, Lady Maria Hastings, for the last uh, 20 years of her, as I say, existence. It is a very simple urn with uh, flowers uh, and etc. And the legend says that the Marchesa was, uh, first of all, most the Marchesa, they, they misspelled the name. The Marchesa is Luisa, but they, Luisa, but they spelled uh, incorrectly. But anyway, even in death, she was uh, she became a character of controversy. But uh, um, is it the grave that uh, not recently has been uh, in a most overgrown part of Brompton Cemetery? If you have the chance to go, go and visit her because she deserves to be remembered. No long ago, I think it was two years ago, with uh, other members, uh, Luigi, Sbaffi, and Barbara, we went uh, and we, we went to look for her and we had a lovely day in the cemetery. But anyway, this is the end, uh, and uh, the end uh, sort of uh, the beginning of a post death life. This is a young Luisa, uh, when she was, uh, um, I suppose, at the time of her engagement. Luisa was born, as I said, in Milan uh, from a very wealthy family. The mother was uh, a lady of the middle class uh, Milanese society, and the father was a gentleman of Austrian Lebanese origin that he became very wealthy uh, via the textile industry. And uh, Luisa. Um, had an older sister, Francesca, she was a year, a year old, and uh, when uh, she was born, Luisa uh, was basically considered, uh, with Francesca, the most important girl, richest girl of the time in Europe. Luisa de Rosa Maria von Amman Casati is uh, the name that she should be remembered you know, in full. The von came because in 1901 um, the father um, received the title of count for his services uh, in, you know, offered to the, to the kingdom 
by the um, Savoia king, Umberto I. But anyway, as you can see here, she's still a typical, um, you know, age, uh, um, we we'll say a lot of lace, white, <coughs> deep, dark hair, deep eyes, but um, clearly, you know, the marriage to the Conte Camillo Casati stampa di Soncino, very wealthy Milanese uh, um, family, he was not very happy. She married young because she had to do as every woman of her age and etc. that, uh, you know, after being orphaned at 15, she had to do something. She was taken under care of, uh, um, for education by her um, paternal, uncle, um, paternal uncle, and she had this life of riding and etc. and ended up married very young. This is a photograph of more or less at the time of engagement. But uh, clearly, as I mentioned, the marriage was not very happy. After a year, she gave birth to a daughter, the only daughter that she ever had, the Christina, that it was named after uh, a character of a literature of the time that she, um, Louisa loved, the Christina di Belgioioso. And uh, it was not exactly a very good mother and daughter uh, relationship. Uh, you know, Luisa um, had a daughter, but she never really linked with her very much. The daughter basically, uh, as soon as she could, she moved down to uh, to England. She went to study in Oxford, and later she married the Earl of Huntington. But anyway, this is one of the few photographs we have of Luisa with a daughter. And here still, Luisa, in 1901, is the typical lady of the high society of the time. You know, the, she probably was uh, clearly not very happy, as you can see for expression, very stern, you know, very, there is something in her eyes that it doesn't trans, translate as a mother to a newborn daughter, but anyway. This is, a, I, I skip for a few years, uh, you know, and uh, Louisa, she meets uh, socially uh, during a, a, a hunting uh, event, this gentleman, Gabriele D'Annunzio. Gabriele D'Annunzio, that is uh, the maximum, the most important Italian poet of the, of the 20th century. He was a character that he really influenced with his passion, with his ardor, with his vigor, a lot of, uh, of the Italian society as we know today. And uh, he fell madly in love for, for Luisa. And that is the time that Luisa stopped to be the, the good lady, the good married woman, and etc. And has become what he called the core. Coré, for him, uh, it was uh, Coré is a th mythical figure of uh, um, Hellenic uh, uh, mythology. She's a goddess of the underworld, and for him, Coré is the nickname he gave to Luisa because for him, it represented this desire of uh, life beyond every possible possible um, moment you know you can expect. Anyway, it was a very intense uh, relationship. You know, for all the rest of the life, uh, they they've been uh, basically, in, I would say, more than physical lovers, a more mental lover. It was all in the mind, but they cherish each other until until the end. Gabriele D'Annunzio, uh, in his uh, uh, most famous uh, uh, abode in Italy, in Gardone Riviera, has uh, this uh, um, this statue of uh, a tortoise on the front uh, on the front in the main room on the. Sala da pranzo in the diner room. It's a tortoise uh, um, sculpture made on the carapace of a tortoise that Luisa gave it to him, and uh, as a present, because uh, uh, after she split from uh, the normal life and she's become what she's become, as we can see in a second, she started to be befitting uh, friends with gift, very unusual, very particular, very you know, out of the out of the range, put in this way. And this tortoise, uh, basically, it was a symbol of their passion. When the, the tortoise was uh, free in the garden and she uh, died of uh, eating a lot of tuberose flowers uh, in digestion, <laughs> and uh, the, the poet decided to have, uh, it was not possible to embalm, but to use the carapace to create uh, the sculpture. And it's most beautiful, if you go to Gardone, there is uh, on the main table, I think, uh, you know, it's unforgettable, this uh, statue of this uh, bronze head tortoise in this real carapace. And as you can see, the Gardone Riviera Vittoriale is one of the most incredible places you can visit, uh, I think, in the world, because it's absolutely fantastic. One day will not be enough to visit all of it. Where is it? It's in Gardone Riviera, northern Italy, on the Lake Garda, on the shores. Um, Absolutely amazing. There is even um, a boat inside the, the garden. Oh, wow. Because this chapel was... Uh, 
incredibly passionate about everything. He's been, uh, you know, before the First World War, uh, he, with some friend, he went uh, to an expedition with a very rickety plane that tried to uh, distribute a flyer to say the Fiume, um, a town in the northwest uh, of Italy, is free and etc. The famous, um, what is called the Bucari, the, um, the, 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 the expedition to Fiume and Bucari, correct? So it was very, very entrepreneurial. It was very. He used a lot of his influence and a lot of his, you know, of uh, his finances to do the things he believed in. Also, as I said, one of the most it was uh, the freedom of Italy from the Austriac, the Austrian um, uh, control, because Venice at the time it was still under the Austrian uh, uh, empire. Anyway, thanks to her, you know, she became the core. She became the muse. He was uh, uh, Ariel for her, but he was the moment that Luisa realized it was uh, something else in life. She decided to become, uh, what do we say, the living artwork, un opera d'arte vivente. And uh, she started to live, she had the means because she was still very, very, very wealthy, you know, and she became this, what do we know now, the most important uh, images of her, transformed. This is a famous picture that uh, uh, Bar 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 Baron von Meyer, and the second is uh, her with the famous uh, pet python. She became so um, detached to what was a normal, uh, everyday reality, because she wanted to become someone living in the, the kingdom of dreamland, uh, or so, sort of. Everything was like uh, uh, a new magic experience for her. And to be allowed to spend time with the Marchesa was one of the most incredible experiences someone could ever have. She was, uh, the, I would say, probably the most influential woman in the beginning of the 20th century. You know, this picture, as I said, with her hair, with her eye, the gaze, you know, the note, the change from the black hair lady uh, with a very simple face, uh, very meek makeup, she became uh, this, uh, this muse with the, you know, short hair, dye bright red, very uh, dark, uh, you know, lined eyes, because uh, she was not exactly beauty, considering the, the canon of the her days, but she had something that was beyond, it was a, what they call a charisma maybe, and she was fully aware of this. The only point of beauty was her massive green eyes. She was quite tall, slender, apparently using a lot of uh, cocaine, that it was very fashionable, you <laughs> say, <laughs> keeping slim, and uh, not eating much, but uh, all the rest was the excess, excess life. But, as you can see, from uh, the lady here, yeah. the maternal, etc., the change is incredible, completed. Yeah. You know, just here you can see some sort of a sudden, a sort of uh, unhappiness behind those eyes. But here, you can see now, she is the woman. I am the woman. I am the core. I am the one that wants to do what I think is right for me. And uh, as I said, I put aside this most famous photograph of her, you know, with a mass of hair and the python, because uh, in uh, towards uh, the the end of the the, the tens, uh, basically more or less soon after the First World War, she started to to hang around with this circle, artistic and etc. And thanks to the advice of Gabriele D'Annunzio, she uh, she moved to live. She left Milan. She left her husband. Actually, the, the separation with her husband was in 1914, so well before. But she moved to Venice, where she purchased uh, one of the most beautiful buildings still existing on the Canal Grande, the so-called Casa Venier de Leoni. Today is, is known as the Museo Guggenheim, Guggenheim Museum, because Peggy Guggenheim to, uh, was uh, fascinated by her and wanted to mold herself uh, on the on the Marchesa. But anyway, the new house uh, of the uh, Cavenier de Leoni became the center of this incredible activity, this party that were you know like day, days long, night long, uh, you know, excessive, exuberant, and etc. And the Marchesa, she's famous for all these uh, extravagances, like a wander around the middle of the night with the two, um, what they should call the eunuchs. Uh, eunuchs. These are two beautiful uh, um, black men dressed like uh, Egyptian slaves with torches and dressed like with a, with a snake or dressed only with pearls or, uh, you know, or with other incredible extravagant uh, outfit. This is the famous. Um, uh, the fame outfit on the left that it was designed for her by uh, Leon Baxter, you know, 
uh, Leon Baxke is uh, famous because he created the costume for the Ballet Russe, the Sergei Diaghilev, that he was uh, an, even, you know, besotted with her like everyone else at the time because she was such an incredibly strong, uh, you know, a person such a, you know, nothing it was uh, too much for her. Obviously, thanks uh, to her, her invaluable, you know, uh, wealth uh, uh, inherited, you know, she could afford it. This, out this outfit is one of the most incredible. Not bad, the other one as well, you know, the kind, the kind of fountain of light. Someone sent me a link, Barbara, as Buffy sent me a link, as some American lady, she created a copy of this using like uh, uh, illuminated tubes, obviously. <laughs> Again, an ad homage, because, as I said, the, her Marquesa has um, this uh, is still long effect. She has this magic, you know. It's no beauty on her, but it's the strength of a desire to be beyond every, you know, everything else considered good in society and etc. But Venice, for her, become like a, this incredible hub for these activities. This is another outfit that it was like, uh, she used to basically dress like this every day. You know, Mariano Fortuny created for her the famous Delphos, you know, and uh, still now, one of the most sought after garment, if you can get old in some vintage affairs or something like this, of a Delphos, please buy everything. With, uh, is the outfit, the style. It reminds her of a uh, uh, Greek uh, tunic, oh. but the pleating is made in a specific way that is still now we don't know how because it's kept as very well kept secret by the Fortune group uh, still uh, still existing in Venice. But he created this incredible, you know, garment that he became the most sought after. You know, uh, Isadora Duncan used to dance wearing a Delphi that has been created for for her. But as you can see, the dramatic part, uh, you know, is that this makeup that is so intense, it's like uh, this white face, uh, these dark eyes, uh, and these red lips like blood, uh, you know, drinking blood. Probably she did that as well, apparently. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, in her life, you know, as I said, I don't mention many dates, but uh, something very important is in 1919, uh, she met the English painter Augustus Jones, and they had an incredibly strong uh, uh, affair, very, very... Um, very vigorous, uh, etc. Apparently, people are complaining about the love making and etc. But the point is, Augustus John, with his work, uh, has been able to immortalize in this painting the real Marquesa. I think on this painting that Clayton correctly chose for the presentation, you can see this woman that has this gaze to say, she says, "Hey, I'm here. I'm not going to go. I am. I'm, I am proud of who I am, and if you don't like, I hope it." This is. You know, the image that I think the most represent Louisa, you know, in a, in a way, with some sort, uh, in, in somehow, there is some sort of tenderness, and also, I think, uh, beyond uh, those eyes, beyond uh, those gaze, strong gaze, there is, say, some sort of uh, insecurity, but at the same time, if you're not insecure, how can be so strong towards others? So I think this is the most important portrait that the Louisa we can find with this mass of red hair and etc. Was not her, her color. Still now I wonder how she'd been able to achieve uh, such a perfect redness. Absolutely beautiful. But um, this is uh, one of the most important uh, portrait uh, of uh, her that uh, rest remains. Also with Augustus Jones, that he was quite womanizing and etc. This uh, relationship uh, was able to transform in a lifelong friendship, uh, been able to transform uh, very unusual for those days, uh, as with the Nunzio. Just to give you an idea how avant-garde these people were. They were children of the you know, the late 1800, but still had the mentality to, to go ahead with the friendship after a love affair finished, you know, quite modern in a way. But anyway, it's the one that he, for the rest of her life, actually helped her when she was in, in dire straits with was money. Was he living in Venice or was he in No, he was in England. Oh, so she came yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she used to travel. Now here I got a few photographs of her, still at the same period of time. But the one I want to point at the most, uh, and this is the only picture I found, Louisa smiling. No one, nowhere else, Louisa smiles. As you can see, she was not exactly the most beautiful woman or the most uh, fascinating, etc. But she had something. And the way, and she actually wearing here. Oh, sorry. What's happened? Oh. <laughs> She's wearing here a, a Delphos. This is a Delphos. You see, this is the dress I was telling you about. Um, you know, and you probably even you can see better here. 
But for me, it's very pivotal, this image, because I have not been able to find any other image of Marchesa Casati smiling. This is the only one. Even, even if Mona Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what I will say, these are the, the most important, of my opinion, and you can see she was already in, uh, probably here in her 30s, you know, not very youngest, but still very, you know, collecting artworks because she became a very accomplished uh, uh, art collector. That she basically helped a lot of very young uh, unknown artists uh, of the time, you know. As I said, she was the pivotal uh, woman mecenate of those days. And Peggy Guggenheim stepped on her shoes uh, in every sense. Man Ray was another man, another artist, that was absolutely besotted with her. This picture taken in 1931 depicted her, and uh, people think, oh, it's out of focus. No, because uh, somehow she was a character with, mo with multiple uh, images, multiple personality, multiple looks, multiple gaze. And this is one of the most famous uh, images that he took of her. He did a lot of them. But this is one of the most important. This is another image that is iconic because it is uh, Giovanni Boldini. Giovanni Boldini, that is uh, with uh, John Sargent, one of the most important portraitists uh, of the time, you know, depicts uh, her still when she was a lady of the high society with her beautiful dogs and etc. And as you can see, even here, the eyes, the look, she has uh, this some sort of, uh, you know, sadness. Uh, you know, notwithstanding she has this most amazing outfit and gown, still something that uh, this parallel between, uh, you know, uh, sadness and uh, volitiveness. You know, she has uh, this character, she's uh, this two aspect of Louisa. And this painting, again, uh, tried to capture, but I think not well as the Augustus John one. Now, there's another Man Ray picture of uh, uh, Luisa, dress uh, for a party in Venice, because uh, their party in Venice, the can only, Venice is famous for the carnival, but her parties were all year round. You know, this is the famous uh, uh, Luisa dressed as Elizabeth of Austria, you know, with these beautiful feathers and etc. again, with the snakes and so on. But as you can see, the eyes become like a void, it's like a skull, like a, you know, it's like death, uh, you know, she has this, uh, this look uh, that it goes beyond uh, the normal concept of the, especially in those days. Now, another outfit, this, as you can see, very extravagant, you know, this is uh, probably in the mid-1920s, another one of her parties. As you can see, she wears a lot of interesting things, a lot of pearls, a lot of jewels, a lot of uh, beautiful fabric, feathers, feathers. Because also Louisa was obsessed with the magic, with the occult. All her life she was interested with, with um, everything to do with death and to come back to life and contact the dead. She, for a long time, she hosted both in Venice and the other properties she had in Paris, the mediums and people, spiritualists, that really, they suck on her and on the money. But she was, uh, you know, always looking in contact uh, with the other world. And she, uh, in this point, uh, she was quite following in a way, actually opening what is becoming the early part of the 20th century, the fashion of the most, uh, you know, uh, important theosophists and so on. But Louisa, she was uh, such an inspiration for all these people that they really uh, took on her. And this photograph, remember, keep in mind for later, because it is quite pivotal for something that I'm going to show you in a second. She has been an inspiration. A lot of people, they consider her like the mad woman, but obviously, when you consider some mad, you're fascinated by him. And the upper classes, they were absolutely bizarre with her. So now, I would say, remember the image before, because that, those looks, they had an impact on the decades later. You know, when, uh, um, if you think about fashion, or people, they've been able to influence, um, you know, fashion and etc. Marquesa Casati is the one that, in a way, has uh, the most imp impact. This is a picture of uh, Marisa Berenson, uh, dress inspired by uh, Marquesa, uh, dressed by Thierry Mugler in the mid-80s. Marisa Berenson was another woman that she has a mega impact because she was a head big heiress of a wealthy family, aristocrat family um, here in the UK. And she grew up in Florence, where she'd been exposed to the story of Marchesa, etc. You know, because she met people they knew her in life. Also, don't forget uh, that, as I mentioned before, uh, 
uh, Luisa's daughter Cristina, she moved and she married in UK. She became the, the, the Countess of Huntington and her daughter, Lady Morea uh, Hastings, was the one that uh, uh, helped the grandmother to, when she came to, to England because uh, towards the end of the 40s, uh, in, you know, Luisa basically she was bankrupt. She spent, in, in the mid-twenties, they reckon she had uh, re debts in the region of 25 million pounds. As you can imagine, it was a huge amount, you know, because she had this incredible, lavish lifestyle, mm -hmm. by incredible houses. The last purchase that she made was this mansion house just outside Paris. They used to be belong to a famous uh, philosopher, now escaped the name, that uh, w basically was uh, taken, you know, by the, the debt collector, and they sold all her property, all her artwork, um, to pay a debt. The reason why she escaped to England, she flew here and she lived at the mercy basically of this uh, Denise, uh, sorry, granddaughter, and this uh, friendly gentleman that they were absolutely in love with her, were sort of psychological slaves of the fascination. <laughs> yeah, the charisma of this woman. And um, basically, until uh, 1957, when she died, she was basically living in uh, literally on nothing. Famously, she's been seen, uh, and apparently a photograph, even if I've not been able to trace it, uh, of her scavenging in the bins behind the theaters, the door of the theater in the West End, not for food, but just to get like a little piece of uh, fabric, a feather, something to decorate her threadbare clothes because she didn't have literally nothing. And the family, especially the daughter, completely ignored her. It was only Morea that uh, helped her when pay for a nurse to help her when she needed towards the end of her life. She died of uh, um, an embolism in the brain. Uh, she was, as I said, in 1957. The story goes that she was actually buried on a very um, sad threadbare cloak with uh, Jaguar um, pelts uh, at the bottom, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but very, you know, very old. Something that she carried with her, basically, one of the few things that she had from the good old days when she was able to go around to uh, through Venice with masks and everything, having the time of her life. Famous, as I mentioned, she wandered around, uh, you know, in Venice nighttime with this, with the two servants and so on. And um, you know, wearing nothing except for the boa or the the pearls and etc. And now end up in this way with this very old cloak, not old as mine, <laughs> but uh, you know. Uh, and also something interesting: these two gentlemen, they um, they buried her because they took her over the coast for the the funeral on. Um, with the, the mummy of her little Pekingese dogs that he shed, they mummified when he died. So basically, she is the last companion for life, uh, you know, and uh, it's very sad, but um, at the end of the story, she lived grand and, uh, you know, still we remember her and we still live uh, thinking about her. Because this, as I said, this picture is in the 80s, but we go on. Look, McQueen, Christian Dior, you know, Christian Dior uh, designer was Gian Galliano. Gian Galliano is absolutely besotted still now with her. But you, everyone still has uh, uh, influence. The Rhines Van Noten and the outfit I'm wearing underneath is the Rhines Van Noten. It was one of the co old collection in the early 90s, uh, sorry, mid 90s, um, inspired by her. You know, but still, this woman has an impact. As you can see, the androgyny, the sense of uh, wackiness, the sense of excess, they're still influencing fashion today. Yeah. And as you can see, this is one of the latest Christian Dior by Galliano, you know, clearly inspired by her, you know, by the Venetian excesses. Imagine her coming down to, you know, to the step from the steps of the Basilica della Salute in Venice, dressed with these incredible gowns and so on. And this clearly influences it because, you know, now still a lot of people, they have this fascination and passion for this, for this woman that someone called the most gorgeous snake in the Garden of Eden, because uh, clearly she was not uh, what we expect a maternal woman, but she had something, you know, that even in poverty, even in, you know, in uh, utter uh, dire circumstances, she was uh, herself. There is a recording that I've not been able to use uh, for copyright reason, where her voice, she said, I want to be a living artwork. And until the end, she has, she still is, mm. she's still the modern artwork, not only for who inspired, as I said, Basque, Poiré, um, you know, 
fortune and the modern design, but still for the people they they still in a way absorb her magic, absorb her you know her charm, her uh, enchantment because a woman like this probably never existed and maybe never existed again. But at the same time, a woman that uh, for all her life, when again I repeat, she was utterly poor. She was not never she ate much, but in the end she literally starved herself. You know, still as an inspiration for you know for so many. A very interesting book has been published during the year, a few years back also. An incredibly beautiful exhibition was organized in Venice called La Divina Marchesa. Al Museo Fortuny, where a lot of the artwork that she collected during her lifetime were, um, you know, uh, co you know, put together and expo you know, exhibited, and the artwork that she lost because of the, you know, the debtor chasing her, but the intensity of how this woman lived, the art, art was uh, in her blood. And you probably would say that it was not blue blood, but it was art blood because everything for her, every moment has to be lived to, like it was the last one, to the excess, just to make sure that uh, nothing is wasted. Mm -hmm. And I think her message is, is for us very important that we should enjoy everything comes to us, every moment that we have to enjoy. I'm not saying hanging around with a snake on the neck, you know, <laughs> but, you know, because another famous, uh, you know, an influence the Marchesa Luisa has, in, uh, in history is that, um, you know, Cartier, for example, she used to be very fond of Cartier jewels and etc. It Cartier they, um, took inspiration of, uh, from her. The famous logo of the Jaguar and the woman, you know, is uh, her wandering around Venice uh, in the middle of the night with her two slaves <laughs> and the Jaguar on the, actually I think it was a cheetah, yeah, on the cheat, you know, on the leash. You know, apparently it was, a, you know, domesticated, but still, she had this, <laughs> I had never found a report of any uh, incident, but she had this incredible menagerie of animals, including albino, uh, crows, and, you know, and raven. She has this uh, passion for something that was out of the ordinary, mm. and obviously having the means uh, to do it, uh, why not? You know, but uh, yes, she still, uh, you know, we still breathe the Marchesa Casati, you know, and uh, at the same time, you know, I, it's very sad that, uh, again, I repeat, her grave is totally abandoned, you know, only now and then people go and clear around and mm. so on, but, uh, you know, the most gorgeous snake in the Garden of Eden, this phrase is incredible because it, de it depicts like something that is sinful, lustful, but at the same time you can't resist it. There was a phrase uh, that um, uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio used for her, <coughs> excuse me, Gabriele D'Annunzio created on her a personage, Isabella Ingirami, one of his book, uh, his novel, Forse Che Si, Forse Che No, maybe yes, maybe not. Um, that he basically said that, that she was uh, so important, so beautiful, something that uh, to be loved, uh, you had to leave her, because it was like a drug, like a poison, you know. And that is exactly what uh, made the relationship so important and so long lasting. And uh, this is another image that uh, I like Giovanni Boldini, in a way, captured her in this whirlwind of energy, this uh, woman that she was beyond time, her time, and all time, but she was like, uh, a, I would say, this painting reminds me of a lightning, because she really illuminated her, uh, her years, uh, you know, when she was who she was. Clearly, uh, like every, every lightning and etc., is like a moment in time, but she, she basically, you know, was able to flash many, many times. And still in this painting, and this is a vort you can imagine the vortex of uh, around her, all the people living uh, on her uh, little world, uh, you know, for every word of her. But uh, sadly, as I said, like in every story, she was not a good, uh, frankly, financially wizard. She lost everything. I say poverty was uh, chasing her and etc. Even she has this uh, family aristocratic connection with the daughter and her niece. But this is the, you know, the last one I would say. And uh, basically, what I have to finish would say that something that uh, her friends uh, wrote on her uh, grave that age can wither. No custom stale and infinite variety. This is a phrase from Antony and Cleopatra by William Shakespeare, and I don't think a more apt word, um, obituary, could be written for a woman that is still, after I would say nearly 50 years of her death, is still impacting our day life. And 
as I said, I warmly recommend it. go and visit her, read about her, and uh, pay homage to this uh, incredible character that uh, I, I believe that um, doesn't deserve it to be forgotten. No. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Did she know Nancy Cunard? I think she did. I think the Cunard, Nancy Cunard took inspiration from, from Marquez. A lot of pictures of Nancy Cunard, the famous picture with all the rings right, and right. the eyes, they come from her. She was the woman that, uh, if it was, um, I would say, and the world described the superstar, it would be her. You know, we use the same adjective. She, Nancy Cunard definitely was part of a circle because obviously, even if she was living in Venice, Paris, and etc., they were like all these high uh, society that were merging together. Yeah. Did you know Alison Crowley? Yes, she did. <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, she, um, Alistair Crowley, and was part of a circle when she was in Venice. I think there are pictures of her in Kalema in the build, you know, the village that uh, Crowley created in Sicily, but uh, more than uh, Crowley, I think she was, uh, um, um, I would say, she had a fascination for this young artist called Austin's Osman's Fair, oh, that yeah, it was, yeah. uh, <coughs> you know, she collected some of his work, that is an artist that uh, was a part of the circle of Alistair Crowley, he was a vorticist, he never really became famous, uh, but he was an incredible artist, he died again in utter, utter poverty in South London, and uh, his work, actually, if you had the chance uh, to get some of his work, uh, buy because he is going to get more and more uh, value in the... In the Victor Wynne has grown. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly, because I was part of the same circle, uh, William Lewis and etc. they were all vorticists. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why uh, Osman, Osman Sperry didn't end up in the larger scenery is because of his association with uh, Alistair Crowley because they were interested in these uh, sort of uh, satanic practices and so on. And Marchesa was fascinated by, I mentioned earlier, by everything occult. She has this incredible um, relationship with, uh, with the, the other world. Also, um, Luisa, she came from uh, her family, it was quite, not very religious as such, but the mama was a Catholic and the father was Jewish, so, so she grew up with this idea of this uh, re religion, uh, you know, quite important. She was, a, um, she studied the Kabbalah quite intensely, yes, and, uh, but um, that is something that we don't have anything written about from her, but she was into this kind of uh, esoteric studies. She hosted a lot of important medium of the time, I can remember the famous medium, uh, Eusapia Palladino, she was uh, quite uh, frequently guest uh, uh, with her uh, in Venice, you know, and they had this kind of, you know, I don't say that she was going around uh, in the middle of the night in San Michele Cemetery and etc. but never know, digging bodies, you know. Apparently in the, I found, but I don't know if it's a very attendable uh, source uh, that she had uh, um, various uh, uh, mummies in her place and skeletons, but. There's no autobiography. There are no, no autobiography because she never wrote one herself, but there are lots of other people. The one is in Infinity Beauty and uh, Divina Marchesa. Yeah, there is even a comic one. Yeah, oh, the, yeah, the yeah, comics, yeah. yeah. There are some. It became more and more, but the most important is Infinity Beauty by this American. It's a quite uh, difficult book to find because uh, it was like a limited print uh, and uh, you can't really find that except for extortion at price. You found a copy, yeah, yeah, you know? And uh, I've been looking for, but not like the catalog for the exhibition, uh, the Divina Marchesa in Venice a few years ago, very difficult to find, very sold out. Apparently they sold the catalog in the space of, you know, five days or six days uh, of, the, of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And it was unbelievable, unbelievable. Because you really have the scent, the, the feel, the, the presence, the fragrance of this woman and the impact. And the point is, and this is a funny part, uh, her descendant, because obviously uh, Christina, the daughter, she, she gave birth to what has become Lady Morea Hastings, that she, she died no long ago. And uh, the children of Morea, they are quite wide and uh, scattered across uh, the world. One is in, uh, uh, in the States uh, selling swimming pool in the desert. <laughs> and another one, Octavio Black, uh, is uh, sort of a politician and etc. Another one, I can't remember his name, is called something Vyatt, whose daughter is Petronella Vyatt, the journalist. You remember 
confezione della variety she is uh, quite, she used to be a socialite not on the level of uh, grandma, great grandmother but still quite famous or infamous because she had a long affair with Boris Johnson and uh, she publicly after a while when she was completely put aside she completely um, basically started to write this uh, I would say salacious uh, notes uh, of her relationship and uh, various stories so yes her descendants are still around but not uh, on the same league as her you know and a sister Francesca married she had a completely different life her family became very wealthy still existing in, uh, in northern Italy but they don't do much they don't want to be connected to unfortunately the business uh, doesn't exist anymore but uh, yeah, so that is uh, in a nutshell, you know, the sad story of a woman that has become so important for so many, but uh, forgotten by their own family. James, you know, I think it uh, sort of goes to what you were just saying. A very quick Google indicates that uh, TV's Claire Paulding Channel 4 rating may be a descendant as well. But <laughs> do, 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 do you know if any of the modern family uh, recognize and have they? Made their peace with her. I think the only one was Morea. They shared a fascination with her grandmother, but the rest they are not. You know, even the the branch in the states and etc. They do not. I don't think they have nothing to do. I mean, if you go to see the grave, I know it's a very custom uh, in the British custom cemetery. Once you go underground, you're done. But um, totally, they didn't even pay for the for the grave the, for the funeral. The funeral was paid by these two gentlemen. That they paid the rent. They pay everything for her. You know, and uh, so the family is not uh, because I don't even think uh, the Petronella Vieta ever mentioned uh, her great great grandmother in her uh, articles and etc. Yeah, you know? so, yeah. um, but I think it's a bit kept, stuff. you know, kept uh, aside because she was because uh, also for Christina, for the daughter, the mother that never was uh, really a mother because uh, when uh, uh, Christina was uh, just uh, a toddler, she. Um, you know, um, Luisa and Camillo, the husband separated, and uh, basically she was left with nannies and she never had a direct experience with the mother, so she doesn't recognize, you know. The only thing I read, but again, this is a quote me and unquote me, that Christina uh, detested the mother because it passed on her the ugliness of the family. Because uh, Christina, she was not exactly uh, good looking either, and she blamed the mother to be the genes, because apparently the father, the the family, the um, the, Casa, the Casati um, stampa di Soncino, they are much good looking, <laughs> but not her. So that is the only, but I repeat that that is something that I read somewhere, a pocket for whether it's true or not. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.